people are familiar with angles and vectors on things like World War II tanks and deflection, but it was also incredibly important for the medieval knight. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. I'm a former archaeologist and historian, and I specialise here in armour and weapons, and I'm an antique sword dealer. So, uh, recently I've been looking a lot at tank design from World War II. Bear with me if you're not here for tanks. Um, the simple fact is that a lot of people, when we're talking about World War II tank design, talk about sloped armour like it was some crazy new thing that had been dreamt up in the 1930s, like it was a brand new idea. And of course it wasn't. It went all the way back in human history and prehistory, in fact. And it was incredibly important to the design of medieval knights' armour, equipment and weapons, and even how they fought. So in this video we're going to look at four principal areas where angulation and vectors were incredibly important to medieval knights. Some of the points you'll be expecting, and some of them you won't have thought of. Now if you guys have been following my channel recently, you will know that I love tanks. And in fact I've been filming a bit at the Tank Museum. Tanks are basically armour with wheels and guns. What's not to love? And in fact there's going to be some more tank content coming out of my channel soon. But if you want to get playing with some tanks on your phone, then now's the time to try out War Machines. War Machines is free to play, free to download, you can try it right now, and they're the kind sponsors of this video. War Machines is hugely popular and if you love tanks you are going to love playing this on your phone. You can download it for free right now on the App Store or Google Play and you can use my link right here in fact or the QR code on screen. With over 150 million downloads worldwide since it was launched and 400,000 players every month, War Machines is the massively successful tank battling game where you can learn tactics, blow up enemies, destroy stuff and win missions. It's got 30 beautifully modelled um, original tanks from various periods of history. It's got four different maps you can play on and you can either play alone or you can play as part of a team. You can even join a clan and take part in special events. In War Machines rapid decision making and strategic decisions mean the difference between victory or defeat in real time tank battles. And in a few days time due to their collaboration with the Expendables franchise, Expendables 4 being launched, you can take part in specially curated special content and events on the game. And to support you in these battles, you'll actually be able to select actual characters from the franchise who'll be able to use their special designs and attributes to assist you in your battles. So don't miss out on our unique Expendables 4 themed events. Beat your enemies with our seasonal Expendables special content and immerse yourself in the Expendables and War Machines universes. Expendables 4 is in cinemas only in theatres from September the 22nd and you've got to see it in the cinema. It's got massive action, hot stars and kick-ass fight sequences. So get to theatres and check out The Expendables 4 and also get downloading this awesome new content on War Machines using my link below or the QR code on screen. And thanks once again to War Machines for sponsoring this channel and this video. So thanks for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main content of this video. So these four areas where slopes, angulation, deflection, vectors were important for the medieval knight. So all of you are probably screaming at the screen, armour. We're going to get to that in due course, but there are some other things to consider first. So the very first one I suspect a lot of you won't have thought of initially, and that is to do with stance, how you stand. Now, I study historical European martial arts, that is, I study the treatises for using various weapons in historical periods, mostly 15th to 19th centuries, so medieval renaissance all the way up to uh, the gunpowder age. In all of these systems, the way you stand, sideways on, or the other way on, sometimes square on, is incredibly important to the system you're using. Very clearly if you're using one weapon, then based on the footwork that you're going to use, you might be using passing footwork or lunging footwork, that's going to dictate which side of your body is forwards. Now in terms of medieval systems, they primarily used passing footwork. but if you're using a two-handed weapon or you're using a sword and a shield or a sword and a buckler or even a weapon in each hand, this does mean that at any one given moment one side is going to be forwards and the other side is going to be back. Now this is actually incredibly important when we come to look at armour design because most of the time people don't stand square on in front and in fact there's some very good martial arts body mechanics reasons why you don't usually want to stand square on in front 
with weapons anyway, and that is to do with what it opens up. We'll come to that when we get to armor, but also in terms of your stability. If you just stand straight in front of someone with your feet level and ask them to push you, you're probably gonna fall backwards. Now, if you plant your feet with one in front of the other, then you'll notice that when they push you, you can stand your ground, so you're a lot more stable. Now, when you put one foot in front of the other, that means that your hips now twist. When your hips twist, your shoulders usually twist, and one arm becomes further forward in front of the other. So when we're using a two-handed weapon, or when we're using two weapons, generally speaking, for example, if we've got a shield, the shield forwards, or if we're using a, something like a poleaxe or a halberd and we swing it, we might start with left side forward and move to right side forward, there is a slope on the body. So, for body mechanics reasons, uh, for striking um, energy and uh, being able to hit effectively or deploy defensive things effectively, uh, for avoiding blows, for providing a sloping and more narrow target, because notice I'm a wide target this way, I'm a narrow target this way, uh, standing slightly angled onto the opponent, in other words, providing a diagonal line instead of a completely straight line, is incredibly common, incredibly normal in martial arts one-on-one. -on -one. But what about in a battle? Well, also in a battle. Imagine you're a knight, man-at-arms, and you're advancing into enemies who are shooting at you with bows and crossbows or throwing javelins or whatever. You're going to be, hopefully, carrying a shield uh, in many cases, in many periods of history, and that shield is going to be presented forward, okay? Um, so your body, naturally, is going to be presenting a more narrow target to the incoming missiles, and uh, your defensive object is in front. So building on that, the second point is shields. So uh, clearly shields became a little less popular for knights uh, from the 15th century um, onwards, but they were always used by some people. By, particularly by more likely armoured um, soldiers who didn't necessarily have full head-to-foot plate armour. But in the 14th century, 13th century, 12th century, 11th century, 10th century, and all the centuries before that, shields were incredibly important. So, and they were still used in the 15th century to some extent uh, by common soldiers and sometimes by knights, and they were used a lot in the 16th century as well. And some of them were even made bulletproof, okay? And certainly there were some that were arrow-proof, crossbow-proof, so on and so forth. So shields are incredibly important. Now, a shield isn't just a flat object, so we can basically talk here about the design and the use. Now, this isn't a shield dedicated video, so I'm gonna skip over this in relatively concise terms. So first of all, a shield can be um, uh, curved, it can be flat, and it can be angled in numerous planes. So sometimes shields will be curving this way, sometimes they'll be curving that way, sometimes they'll be both. They might be uh, completely like a, um, a hemisphere, uh, like a bowl almost. Uh, sometimes they can even be concave for various reasons. Um, jousting shields are often like that, to catch the opponent's uh, lance tip and break the lance and things like this. So shields come in many, many different um, shapes and forms, as well as sizes. Sometimes shields can be long and narrow. Sometimes they can be long and wide and curved around like a Roman scutum. Sometimes they can be really small like a buckler and sometimes they can be medium sized in various different shapes and have notches and different kind of shapes and forms. But fundamentally, shields are often, very often used with a sloping surface to the incoming attack. Okay, so sometimes, like that jousting shield I mentioned, the object of a shield or a buckler is to catch the opponent's weapon. But very often, and I would say normally in history, shields are designed to deflect things, for things to skip off them and away from you and hopefully away from the people standing next to you as well. Sometimes that will mean sending them upwards or downwards, sometimes, in fact, more usually sideways. But even if we had a flat shield, if we imagine, imagine a completely flat um, circle shield, uh, which is called a rotella and we used in, for example, 14th, 15th century um, Italy, uh, and curved types we use later in the 16th century, we can hold this. Instead of holding it completely straight on, you will usually hold it at this angle. That means, if you look at me and the camera here, I am covering everything from my right side to my left side, if you imagine the shield projects beyond my hand and beyond my elbow, so anything impacting anywhere along here is going to shoot off and fly past me to my left hand side. So even with a flat shield, I can still provide a deflecting surface, and that was the usual way of using shields. And moreover, when we're talking about a massed troop, a, a whole unit of people, deflection is um, inevitably 
also a factor in that. And uh, deflection, if you look at an arrow shot at a target, it saps a lot of energy. So even if that deflects off and hits someone else's shield there, or even hits a person, by the time it's hit my shield and deflected, two things might happen. Firstly, it will likely lose a lot of energy from the initial impact. So as soon as it hits and changes direction, it's already lost lots of joules of energy. But secondly, arrows are surprisingly fragile. And if you actually watch slow-mo footage of arrows hitting targets not straight on, often when they hit sideways, the tip of them breaks off. So very often, a good hard shield presented at an angle, the, proje the projectiles coming in will hit and break and deflect off and become harmless to whoever, whoever they hit there, at least some of the time, if not all of the time. And of course, this applies to hand weapons as well. So hand weapons are gonna slide off, which creates openings for us to attack into. So number three is specifically helmets. Um, now I'm only isolating helmets in this one because plate helmets were around before plate armor. We'll get to plate armor next. So plate helmets were around basically since the Bronze Age. Okay, so uh, bold um, one plate um, helmets made of bronze were around in the Bronze Age and then later on in the Iron Age we get iron ones. Obviously everyone like Greeks and Romans wore helmets and Macedonians. Um, they were clearly worn right the way through the Middle Ages in various different designs. So, deflection, it should be pretty obvious. So when you have anything that is shaped like your head, and in fact Mother Nature gave you a uh, domed head, particularly me, um, you can see that it is a deflecting surface. So most objects hitting it are going to have a chance of just deflecting off because it is already a round shape. So fundamentally, a helmet as a generic object has deflective surfaces from downwards, uh, sideways and frontal and back directions. Okay, so if it's coming in from the side or the front or the back or the top, it's likely to meet a glancing surface. And despite the fact the material, the bronze or the iron or the steel that the helmet might be made of, the deflective properties of the fundamental shape of a helmet is incredibly important. So for example, if we look at Norman helmets, they are conical, they're pointy at the top because the large majority of blows which might be of danger to a Norman being hit on the head by an Anglo-Saxon or whoever else, um, are gonna come downwards with a sword or an ax and are gonna glance off the top of here. Sometimes it will be a spear coming in the front. Well, they've got the shield held in here, they're peeking over the top of their shield. They can, if needs be, stick down the brim of their helmet behind the shield if something's coming in towards their eyes. And you've got a glancing surface off the front. So helmets are fundamentally, even the most basic helmets, designed as glancing objects. Yes, they can withstand a direct blow, but a lot of the time, in fact, most of the time, they're gonna divert the energy away. Now, as we get into the late 12th and into the 13th centuries, we start to see types of helmets, for example, like the Great Helm, which have facial protection. And it wasn't long before they realized that these facial plates could have def deflective properties as well. And so um, we start to see by the 14th century, we start to see visors devised which have glancing surfaces to them, rounded and eventually conical and pointed shapes. And later on, if we go into the 15th century, there's various other types of shapes that often have a projection in the middle of the face to send either hand weapons or projectiles off and away from the impact point. So don't always think about armor as being able to stop an incoming round like modern tank armor, but think of it as more, most of the time, deflecting an incoming blow or um, shot from a, uh, an arrow or crossbow, rather than necessarily stopping it. Sometimes it stops it, but most of all you want to deflect it. If you can deflect, then the plate can be thinner and doesn't need to, by itself, just stop. So a curved plate, an angled plate, a sloped plate is always better than a flat plate. And in fact, with visors, we see further adaptations. As I've mentioned, the conical shape and the curved shape that we see to the front and a distance away from the face so that any impacts are not just carried straight into the nose or the, or the teeth or whatever. So there's a certain amount of crumple zone, essentially distance between you and your face and the visor. But the shape of it, it enhances deflection. But moreover, look at the shape of the ocularia or vision slits or holes and the breathing holes. So one thing we often find with helmets from the, what probably starts in the late 13th, but certainly by the 14th century onwards, we start to see breathing holes and vision holes, which are specifically designed to deflect away or be hidden from the opponent's blows or shots. 
Example, so vision slits often have a box-like structure sticking out here, okay? Uh, sometimes there's a scoop upwards whereby the top edge is inside the bottom edge, sometimes the two meet together but either way it's quite similar to later gun emplacements and indeed tanks and things on fortifications. It's designed so that should something hit near the vision slit it is deflected away from the vision slit rather than into it for obvious reasons. As far as the breathing holes are concerned often there are forms of the visor, forms of the faceplate that are designed to um, deflect things away from those breathing holes and one of the most common examples is that the breathing holes are on the right hand side but not the left. That's not true of all helmets, some helmets have them on both sides to give more visibility, better breathing, so on and so forth, but many many helmets have more holes on this side than this side. Why? Two reasons. Number one, if your holes are on this side it means that the right-handed opponent, and bear in mind in the medieval period most people were taught to fight right-handed, are striking from the right here and that means their blows are predominantly, not all, but predominantly going to be landing on the left. If they're predominantly landing on the left that means that that is the most solid area with the fewest holes. So a war hammer or things like this with spikes, the poleaxe are not are less likely to go through on that side and also it means the structure of this side is stronger. But think about missiles if you're being shot at. Remember what I said about shields and turning your body sideways on to advance into the enemy. This means now that your vision, uh, sorry, your breathing holes here, your breaths as they're sometimes called, are on this side away from the incoming bolts and arrows and this side of your helmet with fewer holes is the one getting struck and therefore you're safer. Now the fourth and final area is I'm just going to give a very cursory look at this because it's a massive and complicated area which I might do a dedicated video on in the future if you have an appetite for it. So if you would like me to look into this in a dedicated video in the future I'm happy to do so and this is body armor generically. Okay so fundamentally we start off in the early middle ages where the most armor that anybody's really got apart from a helmet is a male or chainmail shirt. Now in this case angulation doesn't play a big part. Really you're relying on the shield and standing sideways so if you've only got a male shirt the best thing you can do is make yourself a narrow target to the opponent and make sure you keep your shield in front because frankly if the male shirt gets shot with an arrow you're probably in trouble. Uh, it won't always go through. Male can protect against arrows depending on the type of arrowhead uh, but arrows work pretty effectively against male. When plate starts to come in, initially in the 13th century with something called the coat of plates on the torso, which is a series of plates riveted to the inside of a fabric or leather garment worn underneath the surcoat. So initially they start to add plates to the torso because that's where the internal organs are and that's the best, most important thing to protect apart from the head. Um, and then later on we start to get plates on the arms and legs such that by the middle of the 14th century, so we're talking about the 1340s, people are already pretty much covered, at least the best, the most equipped and the most well equipped and the richest knights are pretty much fully covered in um, plate armor, plate steel, plate iron from head to foot. There are some gaps, there are some gaps that arrows can get into but by and large they're in full plate harness. Now the first thing to say is Plate harness does have some openings. The most obvious, um, uh, most obvious armor openings, generically, if we talk about them as a whole rather than specific armors, are anywhere around the face and neck where there are junctions between the helmet and the rest of you. Okay, so for example, a male aventail, or if you have an open place face helmet, the armpits the insides of the elbows, these are places you can't easily put plates. It is possible but it wasn't usually done, it's usually just male or chain mail there. Um, the groin, the backs of the knees, the insides of the hands and uh, entrances to the gauntlets, into the cuffs, um, and sometimes the feet or around the ankles. So there's not a lot of openings but they're there. Now one of the major openings in armoured fighting that you exploit is armpits. So for that reason it's quite important to keep the um, armpits covered and obviously if you're holding a shield you can do that quite well if you're advancing into arrow uh, shot for example. But you also have to think about the inside of the elbows and I know of at least one named individual in the Wars of the Roses for example who got uh, taken out of the battle by receiving an arrow on the inside of the elbow. So um, it's important to keep those openings closed but obviously if you're fighting someone and they're trying to hit you and you're defending and fighting back with various weapons 
there are going to be things being exposed. And if people are shooting arrows at you at the same time, then sometimes you might catch one there. But nevertheless, angulation is incredibly important. And how you stand and where you place parts of the body and how you expose, expose certain things to incoming attacks or shot is incredibly important. So armor was designed to create angles. So the coat of plates initially is essentially a um, almost barrel shaped defense. So it's curved around this way, but it's relatively flat on, flat on the front. So one of the next developments that comes along for the torso, and we'll look at the torso here for a second, is that the globose or domed breastplate comes in. And the advantage of this is that whether it's a lance on horseback, whether it's a crossbow bolt or an arrow, or whether it's someone with a, you know, a sword or a poleaxe or whatever, anything hitting here stands a very good luck chance of deflecting off. So one of the first deflecting chest protectors we find is the globose breastplate, initially worn just by itself over a male shirt. And one of the things that very early on it becomes apparent they have to add to it is a V-shaped, what's often called a stop rib, up here. If you watch Todd's, uh, Todd's workshop and you look at the arrows versus armor tests, you can clearly see this type of breastplate when it's hit by an arrow here, the arrow will often skip up and deflect up what would be into the person's neck. By having this V here, it means that the arrow now hits that V and shoots off over their shoulder. This would also apply to any other weapon coming in like a lance on horseback or a pole axe on foot or sword or whatever. So, Globose breastplate with a V stop rib. Obviously they eventually add back plates and side pieces onto it. And the next thing that gets added is a skirt, sometimes referred to as a fold. This is a problematic word because fold often actually means the male skirt rather than necessarily the plate skirt. So let's just call it a skirt here. A plate skirt added below. And this together, the breastplate, back plate and skirt forms what's called the cuirass or cuirass. Now, with the skirt, it is a long cone-shaped defense, so it is rounded and it is also sloping, so it has two, at least two angles to deflect things off. And obviously a lot of blows that are coming downwards are going to skip off it because it's a great big cone. So as far as the knight's torso is concerned by the 14th century, certainly by the late 14th century, we have a sloping surface on the front, the back's less uh, less of a problem so that tends to be a bit flatter because you're not being hit on the back so much and then the uh, the skirt itself is also a sloping surface in two different directions. Now the limbs, arms and legs. So arms and legs defences share quite a lot of similarity. They're essentially made of the uh, three parts essentially the lower, the middle and the upper. Lower, middle, upper, same on the legs, lower, middle, upper. Um, and then for the shoulders, you have additional pieces to obviously cover the shoulders, uh, known as a spalder or a pauldron, depending on what design it is, uh, which cover, cover that as well. And um, obviously the top of the legs are covered by the skirt, so that covers that junction, and you usually have a male skirt underneath as well for extra defense to help snag people trying to stab underneath your uh, plate skirt into your crotch. Um, and inherently, arms and legs are tubes, okay? And tubes are inherently deflective. So arrows, spears, swords coming in at your arms and legs, a lot of the time are gonna deflect off. But there are additional deflectors built in. Um, so for example, at the top of the legs, you often have another stop rib. So we talked about the stop rib at the top of the breastplate, but you often have stop ribs at the top of the cuisse, as it's called, that's the thigh plate. Because if someone, if you were sitting on a horse, for example, and the lance hit your upper leg, it could skip up underneath the skirt and stab you in the hip or the groin. You don't want that. Um, so you have stop ribs so that if something hits, say this is your thigh here, if it hits your thigh, instead of skipping up and going underneath your armor, it hits that stop rib and gets deflected outwards and away from you. You can also find stop ribs on the uh, van brace, that's the lower, uh, the forearm defense, for people when you're fighting uh, in close combat or indeed shot by an arrow, to prevent the arrow from coming up the van, uh, van brace and coming into your elbow, for example. Uh, and so it hits that stop rib and doesn't get there. So you're protecting that um, inside bend of your elbow with yet another little deflection bar or plate. We've got the cauters or cooters uh, protecting the elbow. They are conical at the end, very, very deflecting. You basically never feel any hits on your cauter. Certainly I haven't done on my armor, incredibly protective. But you also have a wing at the side there to protect the angle to the inside of your elbow. And finally, pauldrons. Pauldrons are large plates covering your shoulders. Smaller ones would be called, called spalders. Inherently, they are 
sort of globular in form, so they are inherently deflective, but you'll often find, yet again, stop ribs on them. Very often on a pauldron you'll have a stop rib to prevent something that hits you here from skipping up underneath the edge of your helmet. Um, and sometimes, on a left pauldron, you'll actually find a reinforcement plate here, which will have deflective lines and fluting and things like this put into it. And this is the final thing to mention about all armour as well. Fluting, we've talked about stop ribs, but fluting and the general form of it and line of it, particularly by the 15th century, was really starting to look at corrugation, so making direct impact uh, stronger through its arched structure, but also lines and vectors in the armour to guide and steer incoming points, arrows, blades, away from openings like the armpit, the inside of the elbow, or underneath the helmet. So armour by the 16th century had really, I would say, reached its epitome, where we've got every part of the knight's armour from head to foot is designed to provide deflective and vectored surfaces from incoming weapons. So just to finish off, I want to say that in this period there are obviously other things which use angulation and vectors to provide greater defence. There's, for example, handguards on swords and even certain types of disc guard and the general form themselves of certain pole weapons like pole axes and halberds and glaives. In addition to that, there's also fortifications as well. And I think you probably all know watching this that castles initially were obviously designed to protect against uh, things which couldn't usually breach the walls unless you, unless you had a massive siege engine to sort of bring the wall down or breach the wall by climbing over it or uh, whatever, or break through a gate with a battering ram. When guns, when cannons came in, which was really relatively early, it was in the 14th century, already we see the siege of Harfleur in 1415 under Henry V um, using guns to bring down a fortification. And obviously by 1453 with the Ottomans, they were using massive guns to breach the walls of Constantinople. And by this point, castle walls were being designed to oppose incoming shots as well. And we start to see, certainly by the Tudor period, we start to see castles specifically designed with vectored faces to deflect incoming um, cannon shot. And to some extent, this had already been uh, prototyped, should we say, with earlier fortifications against trebuchets and other forms of catapult for shooting heavy stone balls, for example, at castles, they'd already started to think about this thing. So if we look at the bottom of a castle wall, they're often angled out in such a way that so that things will bounce up or bounce off. Um, and so they had been thinking about vectors and angles already in fortifications. And in fact, if we're honest, we can say all the way back to the Roman period and earlier. And just briefly before I go, just to mention once again, thanks again to War Machines for sponsoring this video. Remember to check out The Expendables 4 in cinema in uh, late September, September the 22nd. And also check out um, the game War Machines. You're not, you're, you can have a lot of fun with it if you like tanks, if you like The Expendables. So check out that link down below or the QR code on screen. And thanks once again to them for sponsoring this video. So I have been Matt Easton and I will continue to be next time. Thanks a lot for watching. Please give me a thumbs up and a subscribe if you haven't done already, and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.